This is Samuel Mitchell, reporting for Endeavor Freedom, and today I'd like to introduce Sue Jameson, a giant figure in the struggle for independent living and community choice. Hi, Sue. Hi. One of the first things I'd like to ask you is uh, how exactly did you become involved in this type of work in advocacy for people with disabilities? Okay, I'll try, but I'll first of all say that if I have any history that is significant, I don't want to take credit for it being giant and disability work, and that's partly because of how I want to answer your question. What I was and have been is just a lawyer for a legal aid office, and I was sort of trained and raised in the legal services tradition, which is about access to legal services by individuals who otherwise would not have attorneys or paralegals or other legal resources. So how I came into all of this was really like this. I had a job for a legal aid office in Jacksonville, Florida in the 70s. And my job was to expand legal services for low-income persons to a county in North Florida where I discovered there was a huge institution, the likes of which I'd really never seen, let alone been in. So when I reported back to my legal services director that if this was my job to expand legal services to individuals who couldn't afford lawyers in this part of North Florida, we certainly had to expand services to that institution. And that began 25 years of trying to figure out how it can be in our world and in society that so many people are uh, confined in places where they have virtually no access to any aspect of society, let alone legal services. And my mission has been, or my passion has been around making sure individuals in that situation have a hope of some access to understand what their legal rights are. Would you explain, because a lot of people don't really know, uh, in the disability community we're familiar with it, but I find that outside of the disability community, people really don't know what the Olmstead decision is or what it's all about. Uh, would you explain that? Sure. So in the course of uh, just providing individual representation to people and in institutions, um, and I was able to continue that work when we moved to Georgia from Florida, and I was able, with the support of Atlanta Legal Aid, to develop a special project to try to do some outreach to institutions. Anyway, in the course of that, um, in a really routine case, um, I and others represented Lois Curtis. Talk about a giant in disability rights. Um, Lois and the other plaintiff in the Olmstead case, Elaine Curtis, were very brave to stand up to the uh, authorities at that hospital and to have the patients to deal with attorneys with all of the problems in their lives. But anyway, they were willing to file a lawsuit. And the case went, to everyone's surprise, from uh, the district court in the northern district of Georgia all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And to answer your question, Sam, what the court said was that any person who has a disability and is receiving services for that disability is entitled to receive those services in the most integrated setting. Um, the significance of Olmstead is that that principle, right to services in the most integrated setting, was applied to institutionalized people. 
In other words, that was language right in the Americans with Disabilities Act that states must provide disability services to people in the most integrated setting, but it had never been applied <coughs> in this obvious setting, which was people locked up and confined and uh, separated from the rest of society. So Elaine and Lois were people who didn't need to be institutionalized, just like, as you know, and the disability community especially knows, are thousands of other people then and now still in these state facilities and in nursing homes. Um, but no one had ever clearly associated that group of people with this particular part of the ADA, which says public entities have to serve individuals with disabilities in most integrated settings. So what it means is if anybody is in a segregated setting, meaning the other people there are also people with disabilities, rather than being in a setting like the rest of us in a community or in a neighborhood, that that person has a right to say to the state, I need this service, whether it's a state psychiatric hospital or a nursing home, Medicaid benefits in a nursing home, but I don't need that service in a segregated setting. And under the ADA, the state is obligated to provide this service in the community. So you're saying that the Olmstead decision was an extension, really, of civil rights. Of the civil, of the rights, civil rights set forth in the ADA. Yes, yes, set forth in the ADA. Okay. It's definitely a civil rights case, and, and maybe that's what you were getting at, Sam, is that yes. that is not only do people not think of it that way, a lot of people don't understand it, that this is the new, well, I know that civil rights issues continue, so I, maybe I shouldn't say new, because minorities still face civil rights problems, of course, but it's, it is a civil rights struggle, just as any civil rights struggle that we think that uh, minorities face in this country. I always think about it like this, that, that for example, if you were a minority in the public school system, even though it took years for the that uh, the Brown versus Board case to be effective, um, African Americans at least knew that this was a civil rights issue. And I think the maybe what you're pointing out, Sam, is that most people, particularly institutionalized people, right, don't realize that their civil rights since 1999, when Olmstead was decided, have been, uh, that the courts have been clear that their civil rights are at risk or are being violated on a routine basis. 